This video is sponsored by Bai. Bai places orders or bids on products from Japanese online stores and auction sites on your behalf. Your item is then shipped to Bai's warehouse, and from there, it's prepared for international shipping and sent to you. Bai's services include popular marketplaces such as Yahoo Auctions Japan, Mercari, Rakuten, and Amazon Japan, to name just a few. Bai ships worldwide, including to Europe, North America, and Oceania, and offers a selection of insurance plans so you can rest easy knowing that precious piece of gaming ephemera you've been searching for for ages will arrive safely. Bai is giving Video Dojo viewers a 2000 yen first time purchase coupon for signing up using the link below. Try Bai and save 2000 yen, that's more than $14, on your first purchase using the link in the description. By using Bai, you can buy anything from Japan. While Namco is primarily known by video game fans for their many decades of arcade classics and home console hits, the internationally renowned company has, during its over half a century of history, also dabbled in areas beyond gaming, including theme parks, consumer electronics, and even robotics. Today, we'll be taking a look back at one of Namco Robotics Division's most forward-thinking, mysterious, and potentially ill-fated creations, namely the robot band Pick Pack. While there has been a handful of interviews, official coverage, and enthusiast reportage on this specific area of Namco's history, up to this point it's pretty much always been conducted in Japanese, with very very little being produced on this specific topic for the English language. Rather than attempting the foolhardy task of condensing the entire history of Namco's non-gaming output into one video, I'd like to instead focus in on one specific aspect of this niche topic, and even share a few, as yet undiscussed, details about this elusive idol group. Along the way, we'll be traveling down a rabbit hole of 1980s futurism, laser discs, imprinted memory, and city pop. Buckle up and keep your hands and feet inside the car at all times, it's gonna be a fascinating ride. First, let's begin with an extremely abridged history of Namco itself. In 1955, in Tokyo, Japan, a businessman by the name Masaya Nakamura founded Nakamura Seisakusho, the company that would eventually become Namco. During its first decade of operations, Nakamura's company primarily produced coin-operated amusement rides, such as mechanical rocking horses for department stores and rooftop amusement spaces. A few years later, the company branched out into electromechanical arcade games, often abbreviated as EM or Elemecha. As the name would suggest, these Elemecha games heavily utilize electrical components, and were seen as the bridge between the purely mechanically driven games of old, and the arcade video games that would eventually shake up the industry. By the latter half of the 1970s, Namco had invested heavily in this new technology, leading to significant growth. As the early 1980s rolled around, Namco's business endeavors within the nascent arcade game business had proven very fruitful as well. Aided by the booming Japanese economy and the runaway success of early international smash hits Galaxian and Pac-Man, Nakamura sought to begin expanding further into amusement robots, a desire that stemmed from his background as a mechanical engineer, and eventually led to the creation of a dedicated robotics team in 1980. In a partnership with Japan's Science and Technology Agency, Namco produced robots for use in the Japan Science Foundation Museum in Tokyo. Like most of Namco's robots up to this point, these creations were unique and popular with visitors, but extremely simplistic by today's standards. Later the very same year, Namco produced Nyamco, a robot for use in Micro Mouse competitions. These are events in which autonomous robots navigate through a maze unaided. A follow-up Mappy robot was created the following year. Nyamco and Mappy had the ability to navigate elaborate mazes quickly and marked a significant step up in the complexity of robotics on show, with Nyamco featuring a wagging tail and Mappy the ability to talk through synthesized voice lines. And yes, that's right, Mappy and Nyamco were first conceived as robots several years prior to the release of the Mappy arcade game in 1983, not the other way around. Namco had already produced a significant number of robots in the years since its founding. However, the robots produced in the early 80s feel distinct from the earlier Atom Punk-esque designs that came before them, thanks to the work of designer Shigeki Toyama. Toyama's designs incorporated rounded forms with pops of color, a futuristic yet warm and friendly take on robots, especially when compared to the prevailing image of the cold mechanoid that occupied the imagination of so many at the time. The prolific Toyama would later oversee the mechanical designs for Xevious, as well as designing elaborate arcade cabs such as Prop Cycle for Namco in 1996. Another key player in our story is Norio Nakagata, 
a young composer and musician who joined Namco in 1984. He was offered a music role at the company after bringing in cassette tape featuring original demo tracks performed by his band Aquapolis. At the time he believed he'd be joining in a music role within the games division, but once he began, he found out he'd been assigned to the robot team instead. At this point, mechanical plans for a robot band were already well underway at Namco, with Shigeki Toyama in charge of visual design. Initially, the team floated potential names such as RP-30 and Robo Otto Land, a bilingual pun that relies on the Japanese word Otto meaning sound. The team ultimately decided on Pickpack, a word intended to evoke the onomatopoeic sound of a beating heart of a robot. Nakagata's first task in his new role was to produce 30 minutes of music to be performed by the robot band. Additionally, he oversaw, quote, selecting voice actors and creating data for dubbing and voice control programs. Based on a tweet shared in 2017, it appears that Nakagata composed approximately six songs. This was in addition to two vocal tracks which were written and performed by famous artists, something I'll discuss in detail later. The band was powered by an NEC PC-98 computer, which was paired with laser discs containing sound sources and event timings to keep everything in sync during the performance. Additional functions were overseen by an operator who sat at a control board and had the ability to manually trigger events. It's important to note that the robots didn't actually play their respective instruments, and were simply miming along to this pre-recorded setlist instead. This doesn't mean all of Pickpack's performances were entirely the same though. One fascinating feature was the band's ability to react to audience applause and cheers, utilizing sound level sensors to trigger pre-recorded interjections from a bank of possible voice data, or even determine the order in which subsequent tracks would be played. According to official promotional material, Pickpack is formed of nine members, three of which comprise the main band. Introducing the Dragonfly-like Maria Socket, lead vocalist and keyboard player. Next up is Digital Tome 3, who resembles a grasshopper and sports a futuristic electric guitar. And last, but certainly not least, the rotund beetle, Strobo Gonzalez on drums. The remaining members of the band include the diminutive Meiji Mantaro, who acts as the band's MC and hype man, and a backing group called the Castanets, comprised of five brightly colored mini robos with interactive stomachs. The band's performance was structured around a simple story involving a sound-eating monster, whose only vulnerability is to the audience's applause. So, as you might have guessed, it's up to the heroic Pickpack to put on a suitably exciting show, and with the help of an enraptured audience, defeat the villainous monster. After an intensive development period, Pickpack debuted to the public on November 17, 1984, at AMROF, an amateur robotics fair held at Tokyo Science Museum. No footage of this performance has ever surfaced online, but Namco did announce, in NG Magazine Quarterly Issue 8, that Pickpack were in attendance at the event. This article also included a selection of photographs of the band, most likely taken during this performance, although I haven't been able to confirm this. While the team worked hard to produce Pickpack, the overall results were seen, internally at least, as unsatisfactory, with the total production cost of the band said to have been 15 million yen, or around 18.5 million yen in 2022 when adjusted for inflation, with Namco charging exhibitors a rental cost of approximately 3.5 million yen for one week's performance, as was the case with Amroth 84. Pickpack's imprecise movements when compared with other comparable robots was cited as a major shortcoming by management. Despite the perceived failure, the endeavor was still remembered fondly by many who saw the band perform, and those who worked on the project. In an interview conducted in 2016, Toyama talked about the importance of emotion within robotics, emphasizing the ability to relate to a robot being more valuable than high technology. Quote, In the past, we used to make just for fun ideas of what we wanted the future to look like. Nowadays, there are robots that are more accurate and can really play instruments. But is that really entertainment? Personally, I think it's not very cute. If we don't think about emotion as well as accuracy, we will never be able to talk on an equal footing. In March of 1985, the International Science Technology Exposition opened in Scuba, Japan. This international specialized exposition, more commonly referred to as Expo 85, followed in the footsteps of many world's fairs that came before it. Scuba played host to pavilions featuring a number of forward-thinking and cutting-edge installations by both domestic manufacturers and the international community, and was centered around the theme, Science and Technology for Man at Home. Despite this, the event wasn't just about raw technological advancement, 
It was also a utopian look forward at a possible future and a showcase of contemporary artistry and craft. Numerous sculptural and architectural works adorned the expo grounds, and several big names from the Japanese music industry produced original music for the event, including Ryuchi Sakamoto, co-founder of the pioneering electronic music group YMO, and Jun Tagawa, all-round avant-garde powerhouse, to name just two. Oh, and the show was full of robots. Lots of robots. About a year prior to the Expo's opening date, Namco hurriedly made plans to host their own pavilion at Expo 85. Namco's pavilion would showcase their creations with a lineup of cutting-edge robots taking centre stage. Unfortunately, this plan never came to fruition, and in the end, Namco shifted their involvement in the Expo from technology to entertainment, acting as one of the handful of companies operating Hoshimaru Land, a temporary amusement park named and themed after Expo 85's mascot, Cosmo Hoshimaru. Namco produced a small number of roaming robots in the likeness of Cosmo Hoshimaru, at least one of which is still operational today. Additionally, Namco acted as a sponsor and co-organizer of the First World Micro Mouse Contest, hosted during the expo, and operated a game center inside the park. A handful of Twitter users who attended Expo 85 have stated that alongside Cosmo Hoshimaru, they did also see Pickpack perform at the event. However, this has never been officially confirmed, and during my many, many hours of research, I have never been able to find any material that backs up these anecdotal claims. These rumors are not a new phenomenon though, and in fact go back as far as 1996, in this Usenet post stating the same thing. It's possible that these netizens, who were more than likely young children at the time, are conflating multiple events or misremembering other robots inaccurately as pickpack. I know as a child I would have found the sights and sounds of Expo 85 pretty overwhelming, and it seems very believable that in the years since the event, false memories could arise as they so often do. I would love to be proven wrong about this though. So, on the off chance that anyone who attended Expo 85 is watching, please get in touch. We do know that Pickpack performed for the public again in May 1985 and July 1986, thanks to photographs of promotional flyers that were made available online. The first of these performances took place in Daimaru department store in Osaka, and the second in Suganoi Resort Hotel, Beppu City, Oita. From here, the fate of Pickpack starts to get even stranger though. Meet Kazuto Kawashima. Kawashima, who himself was a mechatronics engineer, worked with a number of major Japanese companies, including Namco, primarily in a consultancy basis throughout his extensive career. Thanks to an extraordinarily detailed work log he kept between 1977 and 2003, we're able to learn quite a bit more about Pickpack's whereabouts after their 1986 showing in Beppu City. This work log, which is available on Kawashima's artist webpage, first mentions Pickpack in the section dated 1993. The entry states that Kawashima rented the robot band to an Isitan department store in Thailand and an Isitan department store in Malaysia. This is followed up by an additional entry in his work log for April 1994, listing a further rental to a Dali Isitan department store in Kaohsiung City, southern Taiwan. Based on these listings, it seems that Kawashima came into the possession of Pickpack sometime between 1986 and 1993. Whether he purchased Pickpack from Namco or rented them on Namco's behalf during this time remains unclear. With this information, we can, however, begin to build a timeline from Pickpack's debut to their subsequent performances, with a big asterisk next to Expo 85. But what next? For many, myself included, our first introduction to Pickpack 
was likely several years after the band's final confirmed public performance, by way of Namco Museum Volume 4 for PlayStation. Namco Museum is a series of unique arcade collections released between 1995 and 1997. What sets this series apart from other retro compilations is the fact that, in addition to playable versions of many classic games, each entry takes place within a navigable 3D virtual museum, featuring exhibitions filled with Namco history and ephemera, including some pretty obscure non-gaming pieces of Namco history. The theatre found in Volume 4 is styled after a live music venue, and has many famous faces in attendance. They're all gathered for a secret performance by none other than the music sensation Pick Pack. This performance is made up of two songs and a light show. In the Japanese release, the included songs are both vocal tracks. What's interesting is that these songs weren't created for Namco Museum, but rather the two vocal tracks originally written and composed for the band's live shows. Pick Pack's theme was composed by Nobuyuki Shimizu, and with lyrics written by EPO. Shimizu and EPO had previously collaborated on her debut album. The second vocal theme, Robot March, was written by Teiko Aonuki, who later released a version of the song with revised lyrics on her album Coming Soon. Both EPO and Onuki were household names at the time, but for those of us outside of Japan, Onuki's name may sound especially familiar, as her 1978 song 4AM experienced a huge resurgence as perhaps one of the most well-known tracks within the city pop genre, after a whole new generation of international fans discovered it online. One upload of the track has amassed over 10 million views on YouTube at the time of recording. Both Pickpack's theme and Robot March are delightfully poppy and drenched in 80s synth charm. Once you've heard these tracks, it's hard not to fall in love with Pickpack. Even outside of these wonderful inclusions for Pickpack fans old and new, Namco Museum is a really amazing virtual day trip for anyone interested in Namco's history. Across the collection of six volumes, only five of which released outside of Japan, there is even references to Namco's robot receptionist, Reception Komachi, the tea-serving robot Kyuji-kun, and a personal favourite of mine, Wagan, a rowdy Elemecha with a striking resemblance to Godzilla, albeit significantly cuter. In preparation for this video, I reached out to legendary composer Norio Nakagata, who as I mentioned earlier was responsible for the audio side of Pickpack, to ask him about his recollection of the band. He was kind enough to share a selection of photographs of the band members, and in one tweet he recalled that a promotional video had been produced for Pickpack, but he was unsure about its whereabouts now. I was able to find a still image from this promotional tape posted online by Area51Zek, author of the wonderful book I alluded to in my intro, a truly invaluable resource for information on Pickpack. Area51Zek had come into possession of the tape a few years ago, but it stated that they were unable to share the contents without explicit permission from the owner of the original tape. The more I searched, the more I was convinced that there had to be recordings of Pickpack out there, given the fact that they performed publicly at least six times between 1984 and 1994. But as I trolled through any and all material that might have something relating to Pickpack, the more I realized it really wasn't the case. This is especially surprising as Namco pushed Pickpack pretty hard for the first year or so after their debut, even so far as to produce a TV spot for Pickpack. While amateur video recording was obviously far less prevalent than today, I'd say that there is statistically a higher likelihood of someone attending a robotics festival or electronics adjacent event to also have an interest in video cameras. As an example of this, here's Apogee and Perigee, two cute singing robot mascots created to promote Suntory Whiskey. They appeared in a handful of TV commercials and even had their own promotional music album, sung from the perspective of the lovelorn robots. Coincidentally, this album was produced by another member of YMO, Haruomi Hosono, and with vocals performed by Jun Tagawa. Anyway, my point is that there's footage of these two robots performing at a toy fair in 1984 that was captured by an attendee and uploaded to YouTube, so it's not unreasonable to think that something similar possibly existed for Pickpack. Same time frame, same subject matter, same sort of venue. But, with no new leads, it appeared the trail had run completely cold. With the owner of the only known footage of Pickpack unable to release it to the public, and the current whereabouts of the robots themselves a complete mystery. It seemed that Pickpack's performances were destined to only exist in the memories of those who were lucky enough to experience one of their handful of live shows in person. That was, until I found this. A video uploaded by the YouTube account, the President of Self-Portrait Vlog 1988 Basin Chen, back in 2018. It showed a family attending a rooftop amusement park in Kaohsiung City, southern Taiwan, during the summer of 1994. 
Mr. Chen had been digitizing and uploading his home videos for many years, and the channel offers a unique insight into family life in Taiwan from the 90s right through to today. Despite the fact that there's not even a hint of Pickpack anywhere during its 6 minute runtime, this video in particular caught my eye, as it was recorded the same year and in the same city as one of Pickpack's supposed final performances. Could this even be the very same department store? I shot Chen a message, asking if he'd seen a robot band perform that year, not holding out much hope for a reply. A day later, he'd responded. It wasn't the same building, but he did recall seeing a robot band perform that year, and that he'd take a look for the tape in his collection. This was big. How many other robot bands could there have possibly been holding gigs in Kaohsiung City that year? A few more days passed, although it felt like much, much longer. Another message from Chen lands in my notifications. I found the robot band performance in Dali Isatan on the 9th of April 1994. I'll put it together and upload it. And then, a few more hours. The video's already up. Is this it? Yep. This was it. And it was glorious. There they were, Maria, Tomei, and Strobo jamming away. One thing that jumped out immediately is that the song being performed wasn't either of the vocal tracks we knew from Nemco Museum. After a little bit of research, it turns out that the track is called Sinky York by Japanese pop and rockabilly inspired group Jitterin Jin, first released in 1991. It's likely this track was added as part of the band's roster of songs after it came into Kawashima's possession, with the original Laserdiscs potentially not being part of that sale. A sign can also be seen beside the stage, from which a little bit more information can be gleaned. The sign outlines six segments of the show, although no song names are listed. It also states that the total running time is 12 minutes, significantly shorter than the original half-hour show. Another big surprise that may factor into this revised running time is the omission of Meiji Mantaro and the Castanets. Perhaps these robots were sold to other buyers? Lastly. Throughout the entire running time of the video, a rhythmic popping sound can be heard. It took me a while to pinpoint the source of the sound, but I believe it's coming from Strobo Gonzalez, the drummer's pneumatics, which power his up and down motion. It seems that mechanically some aspects of the band were beginning to show their age by this point. Even with this video, there are still a few mysteries looming over the history of Pickpack Band. Do other copies of the elusive promotional video exist? Where had Meiji Mantaro and the Castanets ended up? Anecdotal discussion amongst Japanese fans on Twitter seemed to indicate that Meiji Mantaro had remained in Japan while the castanets had been sold to a buyer in an unnamed Southeast Asian country. And what of the main band members? This appearance in Kaohsiung City is the last known public performance. Did they return to Japan or retire in Taiwan? Pickpack was clearly years ahead of its time. While today the notion of virtual musicians is nothing new, robots as entertainers haven't quite made their way into our lives in a significant way. Instead, in the 2020s, robotics belong primarily to the realm of industry and military applications. Pickpack wasn't a commercial success, but thanks to Toyama's designs and Pickpack's unforgettable music, Namco achieved in building a unique, engaging, and enduring world full of heart that holds a place in the imagination of many fans nearly 40 years later. Getting the chance to see real footage of the band was really magical, and it seemed for a long time like it would never happen. So I'd like to say a sincere thank you to Bass and Chen for sharing that precious footage with the world. My biggest hope is that this video will introduce Pickpack to a new group of people, and that we'll continue to learn more about this charming robot band over the coming months and years. Who knows, maybe someday we'll learn about the band's current whereabouts, uncover another copy of that darn promotional video, or finally get to hear Nakagata's original compositions. But until then, we can watch Maria unfold her wings, Tomei shred the guitar, and Strobo drum away happily.